Thank you for joining the virtual Move to Prosper briefing. My name is Rachel Cleet, and I'm the chair of the steering committee for Move to Prosper. And I'm also an associate dean in Ohio State's uh, College of Engineering, and I'm very excited to be with you this afternoon. Move to Prosper makes affordable rental housing available in neighborhoods that offer access to opportunities. If you are new to us, please check, in at, check out our website at www.move to prosper to find out more. Today, we will hear a brief summary of the evaluation of the impact we are having, followed by a panel discussion. And I will see all of you later during the question and answer at the end of the briefing. But first, I want to, um, we have a couple of words from two of our most respected advocates, Bobby and Alan Weiler. We feel by supporting families for stability in their homes, in their neighborhoods, concerned with their health and education. More importantly, by supporting this work, we're not only stabilizing families, but enabling them to flourish for generations to come. It's now our pleasure to introduce our moderator, Jordan Miller. He's the retired president of Fifth Third Bank of Central Ohio. Thank you, Bobby. And thanks to you and Alan for all your ongoing support. Good afternoon. I'm delighted uh, that so many have joined uh, today to, to hear more about Move to Prosper. I understand we have over 300 people that registered for this event. We have public officials, community and business leaders, uh, some pr Prosper supporters, and some who are probably, probably seeing uh, Move to Prosper for the first time. So welcome to all of you. Uh, my only regret is that uh, these Zoom meetings are a little impersonal and they're not as interactive as it would be if we were uh, doing more normal times. But maybe this is a new normal with uh, COVID-19. So I grew up in a blue collar neighborhood in central Ohio, uh, Milo Grove, and some of you may be familiar with it. Um, that's a neighborhood that's changed very dramatically over the time that I was a kid growing up there. I'm very fortunate that me and my siblings uh, had good parents and we had uh, strong mentors in the community. So we're okay, we're fine today and uh, we're doing well. But many people in communities like Milo Grogan and other neighborhoods similar to that in central Ohio uh, don't get that chance. So that's why I'm passionate about Move to Prosper and that's why I'm supporting this movement. A recent editorial in the Columbus Dispatch points out that, that the city of Columbus is one of the most segregated cities in the country. As a matter of fact, the article pointed out that Columbus was the eighth uh, most segregated city in the United States. This makes it hard for people in certain neighborhoods to access jobs and to uh, get good schools for their children. This, seg this segregation also has a ripple effect on a multiple health issues such as infant mortality, uh, uh, it, it, neighborhood safety, homelessness, uh, uh, getting access to good jobs, and, and, and as I mentioned, access to good schools. So these are just certain issues and, that are challenges for folks that live in communities. Uh, City of Columbus and, and Franklin County have made huge strides. I commend their efforts on affordable housing and social services. Uh, they've done a good job. They're very, very supportive of these initiatives. However, uh, if I'm a family and I live there today, I need help right now. And a lot of the community revitalization issues, they just take a long time. So in the meantime, a lot of these families can't wait. <clears throat> so Move, Move to Prosper is creating opportunities for hardworking women that have children. And they're in low paying jobs. Based on the impact of comparable studies that we've seen around the country, the economic impact for the 18 children in the study is about $5.4 million over their lifetime. Yes, that's $5.4 million. It comes out to about $302,000 per child in our region. But that's not the only economic impact for our region. But let me tell you how Move to Prosper works. It began as a pilot initiative at The Ohio State University. And it includes community partners that focus on coaching and rent support. The goal is to demonstrate the impact on single-headed family household, female 
female households with children under the age of 13? And what happens to them if they move to a more affluent community? A key element of the program is life coaching. The life coaching helps women access resources to address issues they face when they move to a new neighborhood. In short, it helps them learn how to solve their own problems and how to improve their lives. There are four key coaching pillars around uh, coaching. Uh, there are housing stability, financial literacy, education and career, and then making healthy life choices. The participants move to communities owned by private landlords. These landlords are our partners with Move to Prosper. Uh, they offer rental support to help make the move more affordable for the families. Our goal today is to help you gain insight about successes that we've seen so far and to gain your support so that we can help more families. It's my pleasure now to introduce Jason, Dr. Jason Reese. Jason is an assistant professor for city and planning, city and regional planning at The Ohio State University. His extensive program evaluation experience and is well known and respected throughout the country. Jason, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jordan. And uh, welcome to all of our guests who have logged in today to learn more about the program. Um, this is the second program evaluation we've done for Move to Prosper. Uh, the data I'll be showing you today uh, really reflects uh, the experience of our families about 18 months after they've joined the program. Um, and we'll, we're continuing to do this evaluation work, so we look forward to sharing some of these results with you. Next slide, please. I'll start by providing some background context. Uh, if you look at the map on your screen, um, you'll see areas that are light blue um, and also areas that are in purple. Um, what the map represents is kind of where our families were located and where they have moved to. The purple areas on the map are, are where they are residing now. Um, what's important to note is that in addition to the coaching, uh, the families have moved from, in many cases, uh, unsafe housing uh, and also in some cases uh, uh, resource uh, poor neighborhoods uh, into environments that are safer uh, and also then more rich with resources and services from that perspective. Next slide, please. So broadly looking at some of the measures that we're monitoring with families and move to prosper, um, we see that uh, our families are very satisfied uh, 18 months into the program uh, in regards to the neighborhoods that they're living in and the housing that they're residing in. Um, families, generally speaking, reflect most upon the fact that they're in higher quality housing um, that's maintained, that's safe, um, and also then that they're in neighborhoods where they feel that their children are safe. Um, most importantly, families reflect uh, a great deal upon just the increased educational opportunities that they find uh, within the context of their new uh, neighborhoods. Our families have seen uh, some very substantial economic uh, benefits since joining the program in terms of uh, their income and credit scores. Um, nine out of 10 of the families in the program have seen their uh, incomes increase. Eight out of 10 have seen their credit scores increase. And four of the participants uh, 18 months into the program had had you know, positive uh, job moves where um, they've either been promoted within the context of their own organization or actually sought a progressive job move um, with another company or entity. Um, so you can see as a direct byproduct of the coaching element of Move to Prosper, um, there are many financial benefits to families within the program. In terms of health and wellness, we see that um, both physical and mental health improvements have occurred for our Move to Prosper families. Um, six out of 10 of the moms in the program have noted improvements to their physical health. Uh, seven out of 10 have noted improvements to their mental health. Um, and children have seen even higher rates of uh, positive change in terms of their health and well being. And I'll reflect more upon that in a second. In terms of kids in the program, uh, the majority of our families have indicated that kids have seen their grades improve uh, since joining 
or since uh, being in their new school. Um, we've also seen then a very sharp reduction in the context of uh, challenging health conditions such as asthma, uh, primarily because kids are no longer in uh, housing settings in which um, there is such poor indoor air quality. Next slide, please. So in addition to the data, I think the best way to learn about the benefits of this program is to really um, hear the voice of the participants and the moms in the program. Uh, so the next few slides will capture uh, some of the uh, major themes that we've seen in our kind of ongoing interviews with families in, in the program. The first item to note is that when we talk about the mental health uh, changes uh, that moms have experienced mental health uh, benefits of Move to Prosper, much of that is tied uh, to their uh, new housing, right, and the fact that they're living in safer housing, uh, but also then the context of their neighborhood where they feel safer and they feel like their children are safer. Uh, just to capture a quote here from one of our moms who says, it's really nice just being in a place where I know it's healthy for my kids and that they're safe and I don't have to worry all that stress and anxiety is no longer an issue. This has made a really big difference. Um, so you can see just how the environmental changes that uh, they've been able to um, experience because of Move to Prosper directly then benefits uh, their stress and their mental health. Next slide, please. We also see uh, mental health improvements for kids in the program. Uh, and again, I'm gonna capture a, a quote from one of our families. Um, which uh, we hear reverberated in many of the experiences of uh, the moms in Move to Prosper when they talk about their kids, uh, primarily noting that uh, their child is more engaged. Um, as this mom notes, he's more tuned into his appearance, he's less stressed, he has friends. Um, it's these types of kind of subtle changes which really indicate that the benefits of Move to Prosper, particularly around mental health, uh, and uh, engagement in school, uh, optimism, uh, self-esteem are not just happening in the context of the parents, but actually having a deep impact on the kids in the program. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of children's health, what we've seen over time is that uh, many of the families have reported improvements in their child's health, um, and that actually the number of uh, families reporting improvements in their kids' health has actually increased over time uh, the longer they've been in the program. Uh, the bar graph that I have here on the screen uh, illustrates um, responses from our families in regards to uh, changes to their children's overall health um, from the fall of 2018 and also then this last time we've collected data in the fall of 2019. Um, the thing to note is that our most recent data collection, which is represented by the dark red bar on the uh, chart um, that eight of our 10 families have indicated uh, positive changes to their child's health since um, joining Move to Prosper. And this is actually this uh, proportion of families reporting this has actually increased um, from the first time we asked this question in the fall of 2018, which you see represented there in the orange bar. Next slide, please. So Thinking about improvements to mental health and physical health also then has reverber excuse me, reverberating impacts in the context of um, healthcare utilization. And so one of the other factors that we're keeping track of over time is really trying to understand how families within Move to Prosper are utilizing uh, the healthcare system, what parts of the system they're using, and how that has changed uh, before coming into Move to Prosper and after. And I'm just going to share one data point here with you, um, which really relates directly to the improvements, particularly in the context of respiratory health for kids in the program. Um, so when asking families about their ER usage prior to coming in to move to Prosper, what we found was that four of our 10 families were utilizing the emergency room for medical care um, five or more times a year. Um, prior to coming in to move to Prosper. Since coming into the program, uh, none of the families are utilizing the emergency room uh, at that uh, rate. And in fact, overall emergency room usage has declined. And just thinking about uh, the change in housing conditions for 
uh, our families, we can really understand this. Kids are not having asthma attacks anywhere near as frequently as they were before because they're now living in housing that doesn't have issues like mold, um, issues like moisture uh, infiltration into the units, or dealing with issues such as pests. Next slide, please. So um, I'm giving you a very brief summary of our second evaluation. Um, as we close out the webinar today, um, there'll be uh, a link provided where you can read more about uh, the program and its benefits. Um, but a few closing thoughts before I wrap up my portion of the presentation today. Um, first, just to note the importance of um, thinking about housing as an intervention that's multifaceted. And so what we see with Move to Prosper is that uh, housing intervention also then can impact health. It can also then impact education. And that as we think about other aspects of change within families, or thinking about economic progression of working moms, um, that these changes start by reducing or eliminating the chronic stress that families are dealing with. Um, and what I can tell you is that much of that stress came from the housing conditions and some of the neighborhood stressors uh, that these moms were dealing with in terms of this program. Uh, and so as we um, continue to monitor uh, the impacts of uh, Move to Prosper, uh, my anticipation given the trajectory of what we've seen with our data so far is that we'll continue to see these positive outcomes continue to grow uh, through over the next year and a half. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm going to transition back to Jordan and uh, look forward to answering your questions. Jason, thank you very much um, for your insight. Uh, your evaluation and findings appear to demonstrate what we're finding locally here, that uh, that Move to Prosper is moving in the right direction. It is helping families, it's helping children, and it's uh, having some of the uh, intended consequences that we would like to see in a program like this. So we're going to turn it over to our panel now, and I'm going to introduce uh, the panel. I'm going to ask a few questions. And then for you in the audience, what I'd like you to do is to ask questions in the Q&A session. Once I'm finished with the panel, I'm gonna turn it back over to Rachel, and she's gonna moderate uh, the questions from the Q&A from the audience. Uh, so to join Jason as part of the panel, uh, first is Amy Clayton. Amy is a project facilitator for Move to Prosper and is a principal of strategic opportunities. Prior to being one of the founders of this initiative, uh, she had a 30-year career, first at, in, in affordable housing, first at Porter Wright Morrison Arthur, and then as the president and CEO of Homeport. Joining Amy, joining Amy is Gina Smith. Gina is a life coach with Move to Prosper. During the day, she works as a pharmacy systems regional manager at B. Brom Management Company. <clears throat> She is a certified health and lifestyle coach. The last participant on the panel will be Brent Subcheck. He's the president of Castle Communities. Move to Prosper became a reality due to the generosity and vision of the Castle and Oakwood companies. Oakwood is a partnership created by Don Kelly and Rob, Robert Weiler families. Brent also serves on the steering committee of Move to Prosper. So now that we've got uh, our panel in place, I'm gonna ask the first question to Amy. Amy, can you tell us why Move to Prosper has developed a new model? Jordan, thank you so much for being with us today and everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us. So Move to Prosper was inspired by the children. We wanted to create a new model because there's been so much research about the benefits to kids when they live in higher opportunity communities. We don't do that here in our community, um, in our region, and we believe that a mobility counseling program is needed here. A part of the affordable housing solution is creating mixed income housing in Columbus and throughout Franklin County, and that's what we're doing. Families need to be able to live in the communities where they work. And the communities need to be safe, and they need to be full of resources that feed growth and prosperity. Thank you, Amy. 
Uh, Gina, the next question is for you. Uh, can you tell us the impact that Move to Prosper has had on the kids? Sure, the family, the families have a total of 18 children with 16 between the ages of seven and 15. And almost all the moms have reported that the children have had very positive experiences in their neighborhood, making friends, um, enjoying their schools due to the new resources and schools that they have. In fact, three of the children have been tested and determined to be gifted and now are able to participate in gifted programs, resources that weren't available to them before. The moms have mentioned how in the new neighborhoods, they're, as, you mentioned, as Jason mentioned, um, the stress is less. They're able to allow their children to go outside to play in the neighborhood. They're able to play with their friends in the neighborhood without the stress and to be safe. Um, they're participating in new programs and positive programs and things that weren't available to them in their old schools and old neighborhoods. I was talking to one of the moms the other day and talking about her son who had some misgivings about moving to this new environment. And he's had a wonderful experience of making new friends. He's in a show choir now and doing things that he wasn't never thought of doing before. Um, we're building our future by focusing on the children. We're creating a future middle class and a, a place where these children's gifts can be used. So Gina, that's a lot and it's very positive results. Um, can you just give us one key ingredient uh, to prosper success? Um, well, one key ingredient is housing, providing the housing and rental support for the moms to be able to live in these opportunity neighborhoods. Um, another key is the coaching. I'm a coach and I believe in coaching and through coaching, we're helping them understand how to find solutions for those four pillars, pillars you mentioned in their lives, how to find solutions for financial success, for their own employment improvement, um, their own and their family's health and wellness. So um, we're helping them to lead themselves and to learn skills that they can use again throughout life and the things that they do. We're working with partner agencies like Big Brothers and Big Sisters and Jewish Family Services. Um, we've had at least two of the moms, through their own efforts, seek new employment where they've received promotions and better working opportunities. Wow, that's great. Um, Brent, this next question is for you. Uh, Casto and the owners of Oakwood Com Communities were the property owners that work with Move to Prosper. Why did your company get involved and what has been the impact uh, so far? Sure. Um, we got involved with Move to Prosper probably four or five years ago when Amy approached us with the idea on the program um, and asked if we'd be willing to contribute some of our communities to the program. Um, we thought it was a very interesting idea and, and unique way for our organization to give back to the community. Uh, but we were also very curious to see uh, the impact on housing on these uh, higher opportunity areas and, and what the, it would have on the families. Um, so we committed to reduce our rent uh, $100 per month per family for a period of three years. And then the program also provided an additional rental support of $300 per month per family. Um, so, but as it relates to our organization, I think it's been a, a very positive impact, uh, uh, particularly for those individuals who have uh, been working directly uh, with the participants and the program as a whole. So, Brent, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Castle uh, Company and Oakwood have both been tremendous community partners, even without this initiative. Of they're well known for their. Uh, their, their housing, uh, affordable housing opportunities in our community. So thank you. Uh, Gina, back to you. What do you think the families will be at the end of this program? Sorry about that. Um, they'll be in different places. Before the pandemic, some of the families were planning to perhaps go out and purchase property and own it. But the pandemic's inserted a lot of uncertainty and financial stress for people. Um, so far, six of the moms have either had their employment impacted, um, at least temporarily, by what's happening with the pandemic. 
Some of them are looking at other housing options because they need more space. They're in two bedroom units now and maybe because of the age of kids are looking to move to a three bedroom unit. And studies have shown, um, even if some move out of the area, that generally when people have been able to experience an opportunity neighborhood and the schooling for their children, that even if they do move from these communities, they will move to better situations than they left. And still, again, um, benefiting the children. Studies have also shown that once children have a chance to live in opportunity neighborhoods and attend better schools for any period of time, that that's an experience that stays with them, that exposure, um, the, the influence of that stays with them for the long term. Wow, that's, that's, that's great, Gina, thank you so much. And Jason, uh, back to you again. Uh, this model relies on rental support for its success. Can you tell us why the participants need the rental support as well as the coaching? Absolutely. Uh, so I think what we see in terms of our families is really a byproduct of some bigger economic issues that we're dealing with in the context of the central Ohio housing market. And um, primarily uh, we've seen housing prices increase in central Ohio in recent years. Uh, some of that due to the growth in our community. And so in some ways we're very fortunate to have population growth, but that puts a certain amount of stress on our housing market. Um, the other issue that we've seen coming out of the 2008 recession is that wages, uh, particularly for those working in, let's say, the service sector, um, are, have not really kept up with uh, the growth in housing costs. And so um, it's not surprising then, as many in Franklin County know, of, um, that there's a shortage of more than 50,000 affordable rental units uh, in Franklin County today. Um, and that's a byproduct of these housing dynamics um, that we see within our region. Uh, coaching is really critical as a planning and decision-making tool for the families. Um, one aspect of the evaluation has really tried to tease out um, what aspects of coaching are, are really most important. And a theme that we see emerging from this is not just that coaches point people towards information or resources, it's that they're working with folks in terms of thinking through their decision-making processes, um, thinking about how to plan for the long term um, in teaching them different strategies to be resilient when they run into uh, particular challenges. Uh, so it's really the combination of all these different factors, I think, that have um, both the housing and the coaching uh, and the resource-rich environment that's really been critical for the benefits we've seen in the evaluation. Thank you, Jason. I've got one last question, and that's going to Amy. Um, Amy, what are the next steps for the Move to Prosper? So when we launched Move to Prosper, the time was very different. Our economy and our school systems were all working well. Some of the women have asked us since the uh, pandemic occurred about continuing the pilot for a fourth year so that their kids would have three full years in their higher performing schools. The Move to Prosper Steering Committee has committed to doing this and will need to raise additional funding. In fact, when we shared the new fourth year um, idea with the women and the fact that we were willing to do this, Several of them stated, I feel a lot more capable of achieving my goals and I'm overwhelmed with joy. The schools have been so good to me and have changed my child's outlook on life. So we're excited to be able to move forward and do this with the families. Our next steps are then to complete the pilot and to continue the policy work we're doing. We're educating public officials now and community leaders about the need to create opportunities for families to live and flourish in higher resource neighborhoods. And so this would include providing rental support to more families so that they have these, these options. And I'd like to just um, acknowledge that the city of Columbus today um, put out a press statement saying that they'll be using their care uh, funding from the federal government. Um, and part of it will be used to provide rental support. So we're very grateful to the city of Columbus as it acknowledges the need to provide rental support to stabilize families. 
we hope to see this enlarged as um, people do need this type of support. So we are also exploring a demonstration project for 100 families and um, we'll need to look at how to fund that and have sustainable funding, which could include very unique types of funding like a pay for success model. So the pilots enabling us to test the model and a demonstration project would test the impact on the participants and the property owners. So these are the things that we'll be doing in the coming uh, year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thanks to the other panel members. Uh, this is very insightful so far. I'm seeing the Q&A section is, is being loaded up with a lot of questions. And so for this part, I'm going to turn on, Ray, give it back to Rachel so she can moderate that part of our session. Rachel? Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Jordan. We have um, about 20 or 21 questions in the question and answer. And I think, um, Amy, can you address, there's a couple of questions about um, the choice to do a dispersal program where, we move, where people are moving out of neighborhoods and into opportunity neighborhoods uh, versus doing community development. And can you talk about those choices in the program? So to whoever asked the question, thank you. We acknowledge that it's very, very important to revitalize neighborhoods throughout Columbus. But as Jason said, it takes a long time. And as sociologists and others have said, sometimes it doesn't work when you revitalize neighborhoods. And in the meantime, families are left behind. So what, um, we looked at what is going on throughout the rest of the country. And in many, many communities, there are what's called housing mobility programs. And the research shows, as um, was discussed earlier uh, by Jordan, that when children have an opportunity to live in a higher opportunity, higher resourced neighborhood, the children will um, benefit and it enables parents to have access to live where the jobs are. So we want our community to do both, um, both revitalize neighborhoods and at the same time, enable people to have the um, ability to make their own decision about where they live throughout the region. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have a couple of questions that I think that Jason can respond to. There's a really clarifications about the evaluation. Uh, so um, Amy Watson is asking, I heard Dr. Reese state that uh, thanks to better air quality in new housing, participants are visiting emergency departments less frequently. Is life coaching also helping participants to find and utilize primary care instead of emergency mm. rooms? Yeah, uh, it's a great question and a, a data point that's in our evaluation that I did not have time to include in, our, in my presentation. Um, we have seen uh, more frequent uh, primary care use among families uh, in the program. We didn't see that initially. Um, our first evaluation was about six months in post um, program uh, involvement. Uh, but now, uh, 18 months in, we've definitely seen an improvement in the context of how often folks are using primary care uh, physicians. Thank you, Jason. Um, there's another question about, um, and uh, Ken Weil says, in addition to these very impressive self-reported data, did you collect quantitative data on academic achievement like grades and actual healthcare utilization or costs? Yeah. Um, for this pilot evaluation, um, we have some of that quantitative data. Um, some of that is reported to us through uh, the coaches who work with the families. Um, much of our data, uh, particularly around health issues and, and particularly because of HIPAA, um, is self-reported uh, for our group of pilot families. Um, so as you can imagine, as this ev evaluation continues, um, and as the program scales up, we'll be looking at you know, more sophisticated data um, to answer some of those questions as well. Um, just with the caveat that that means a little more uh, administrative uh, hoops to kind of go through given some of the protection issues around health data in particular. Yeah. Um, so Rachel, I'd like to add to that okay. answer, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. sure. um, so one of the reasons that we're not uh, capturing grades with the kids, um, we talked about that a lot early on, and we're looking at 
um, absenteeism and reducing absenteeism as a marker for uh, school improvement, um, what we know is that the kids were coming from uh, poor performing schools. And so as they're going to schools that are now high performing, um, some had grade levels to improve and we're seeing that happening. And so just looking at grades doesn't tell the whole story. And so I think that's important to um, understand of, as we look at how children benefit from living in higher opportunity neighborhoods and going to um, better resourced schools. So we do have a lot of uh, anecdotal stories from the moms that tell us a lot. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, uh, just um, Jason or Amy, can you talk about um, the basis for the economic impact numbers, especially the $300,000 per child? Sure, I can start with that. Um, so these are projections that were created by uh, Raj Chetty and his uh, research group, um, analyzing a very large national data set, um, looking at um, the Moved Opportunity Program in particular, um, and look where he's been able to really look at the long-term trajectory of folks who participated in that program in the 1990s and how they are doing uh, today. Um, so it's actually this kind of uh, retrospective research that he's done in the last few years, um, which has further added to our understanding of uh, how that program worked and if it was beneficial in the long term. And so um, what that research has done is really been able to calculate over the long term what happened to kids who moved um, several decades ago as they're entering into it or as they're adults now. Um, and we can get that longer term view of some of the economic impacts um, that we've seen from that research. You know, and that research also showed that um, the benefits are stronger when kids are younger when they move. And so that's why um, our original criteria is that families would have children that are 13 and under. And the research um, further showed that um, even a few years living in a higher opportunity uh, community changes a child's life forever. So children don't have to live in that higher opportunity for their whole lives. Obviously the longer, the better, but the few year, a few years makes a big difference. Great, thank you so much. Um, there are a couple questions where people are asking, um, how do you qualify for the program? How do you get into the program? How do you find it? How do, how, how do the people uh, find out about it? How do we advertise? So I, I guess, Amy, um, if you could address those questions, that'd be great. So it sounds like from the questions, people would like to be able to participate. And I wish I could tell you that right now we were accepting a, um, new participants. Uh, we started as a pilot this is about um, changing policy so that here in our community, mobility programs become the norm and people um, who are eligible would all be able to participate. So for us to do the demonstration project and test the model that we have developed, we will need to raise funding to do that. At this point, um, we don't have a date for when that will take place. Um, frankly, a lot of money needs to be raised and with the pandemic and uh, it, the timing of raising funds, we have to have a community conversation about this and about whether we just implement the mobility program because it's done in other communities. Um, so for Move to Prosper, the criteria was age of the children, 13 and under, um, having uh, a household size of one to three children plus a single mom. And that's because this is uh, looking at the impact and we have right now two bedroom apartments available. Um, hopefully going into the demonstration project, we will have three bedroom units as well. There's also income. People needed to um, income qualify at 50% of area median income or below and people need to be working so that we provide um, some of the rent, uh, rental support, but the rest is paid by a, 
um, the woman who's working full time at a, uh, at a job. So those are the basic criteria. I think that there was a, a question about, and I think this is, this is really about the program's targeting. Um, a question about um, the question, the, the, well, I'll, I'll just read this to you, I think it's easier. Who qualifies for the program? Last year, moms had so many stipulations like good credit and the number of children they could have. Lots of moms in Celebrate One neighborhood struggle in these areas. So how will your program help these families? Program is for, uh, is not for everybody, and we wish it could be. Um, it, uh, the participating families do need to have an income to be able to pay their portion of the rent and utilities and other expenses. Um, so uh, it would be for some a step up, um, and programs like Celebrate One are critically important to our community. And I do know that there are a lot of people who um, are in, uh, need housing at all incomes and with no income. And it's a challenge for our community to address this. Um, we receive uh, a number of emails every week from people looking for housing. Many are um, pregnant women or uh, women with uh, very, very young children who have um, little or no income. And we as a community need to address how to help people have access to healthy, safe um, housing and all the other supports they need so that their children and they can thrive. Brent, I have a question for you. Uh, what do you think it will take for more organizations like Casto to partner with Move to Prosper? Sure. Um, I think one thing, other landlords um, in our community are, are all involved in various uh, charitable causes, um, and whether that's that's funding or volunteer work, I think uh, one aspect of it is kind of changing the mindset in, in the sense of your traditional uh, charitable partnerships in, in, in terms of not just volunteer work or, or writing a, a check it's now you're reducing your rent and and participating so i think it's just a, a bit of a different mindset and also uh just spreading the word as well uh to the other landlords to know this program's out there um, and i think what's also unique for the landlord is, is they can over time eventually see the economic benefit uh, to the community uh, based on on the program Thank you, Brent. Um, there are also questions about, uh, I think Gina, for you, um, about um, how are we preparing moms for the day that rental support and coaching aren't available? Um, what are the, um, do we help them find childcare? How have they been affected by COVID-19? Those kinds of questions that I think you could probably address. Okay, um, I'll start with um, how they've been affected by COVID-19. So far, six of the moms have had their their employment impacted. So some have lost their jobs, maybe temporarily. Some have had reduced incomes or reduced hours because of COVID-19. Um, how are we helping moms prepare? That's what the financial pillar is about. When we coach women on setting SMART goals about um, your income and how, how are you planning to do things that either help you reduce your expenses, improve your credit, um, or get employment or other means to get more income so that you can position yourself and your family to stay in this kind of situation. So that's a part of coaching for, um, you know, that's very directed and very goal directed. And then I forgot the third thing you said. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's about preparing, yeah, so preparing them for when there's no, right. no coaching and no, no uh, rental subsidy. It's an ongoing conversation and it's a concern at, at we have women who earn at very different levels. So some women are in um, jobs that are positioning them to be able to make their better choices about how housing at the end of this. And then some women have to, a pretty big stretch to try to, to earn the income that's going to be required to continue in this situation. So there really is a span. We're working with all of them on the pillars, but 
um, coming from different places, you know, there are different results. Um, there's another question here about um, are private landlords involved in the program? And if not, are, plans, are there plans to work with private landlords? So I think we need a, um, a little bit of a clarification about how the program works and who we, what kinds of landlords we work with. I don't know, Brent, if you want to talk about the landlords or maybe Amy would like to talk about that or even Jason, someone should pick it up. I you want to, Jason, why don't you talk about it? Or Brent, I guess, sorry, this is very confusing. <laughs> a quick comment and transition over to Brent. Um, so the participants are all residing in the apartment communities of the participating landlords um, and of course their participation uh, came voluntarily um, through outreach by Amy um, and I would also report uh, another thing that we've been looking at is um, how do participants feel uh, do they feel welcome in these communities and and very much so um, in terms of the results we've heard uh, from the participants. And also then we talk to property managers and ask, you know, is, has, uh, how has this person been in terms of their lease compliance and issues like that? And that's also shown very positive uh, results. Uh, but I'll let Brent uh, speak from his experience as well. Yeah, so the, the two landlords that are involved in the program are both uh, private landlords and were approached at the uh, inception of the program by Amy. Um, and I know Amy's uh, reached out to multiple other private landlords and is uh, trying to expand that base. So um, let me add that um, Steve Heiser, who's a commercial realtor who's on our steering committee, um, he was very involved in, actually, he was the one that came to me about starting this, and he and I together approached uh, to landlords um, who are involved. Um, we have gotten emails from other property owners who'd like to be involved, and so when we go to the next step of the demonstration project, we will have other property owners involved. And, um, both of our current ones have committed to being involved in the demonstration project and providing um, apartments moving forward. And we will seek to enlarge um, the options to um, areas throughout Franklin County that are higher opportunity. So when you look at mapping um, done by the Ohio Housing Finance Agency uh, and Jason had that mapping up earlier. Uh, any areas within Franklin County that are considered um, high, higher opportunity, we will have opportunities if we find landlords in those places. Um, just looking through the questions here, there are a couple questions about, um, well, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll read you a couple of questions about policy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, from Kathy Levine, the, the results as documented by the evaluation are dramatic and inspiring to make affordable housing and opportunity neighborhoods plus coaching to all low income families in Franklin County. Would we not need several policies and investments from local government, including set aside for low income families for construction of multifamily dwellings and rent subsidies and others that you might suggest. Um, Jason. Like yeah, I can get a start to that. Um, we might need all of those things. <laughs> there is no one simple policy solution. Uh, and I think um, this program, as well as the work of, of so many people in Central Ohio that have been looking at uh, policy frameworks to address our affordability crisis, um, speak to the need for thinking about um, what artificial barriers are out there that are driving up housing costs or making it difficult particularly to build multifamily that's more affordable. Um, so some of that is taking a look at our zoning and um, what type of uh, restrictive or exclusionary zoning is out there um, that really is an impediment um, to producing more affordable housing. Um, also it probably will require um, some way of thinking about developing more resources to for housing support. Um, as national studies uh, indicate the overwhelming vast majority of folks who qualify for a housing voucher do not receive one. 
Um, and we have a limited number of housing vouchers really funded by the federal government. And so how can we supplement that gap um, creatively uh, to try to create those new opportunities for folks? Um, finally, I would just note that it's also important to remember um, that there are still aspects of discrimination in the housing market. Um, and so source of income uh, discrimination laws are, are very important. Um, and some states have been very proactive in embracing those so that folks who do have a housing voucher can actually go to a community where there's an apartment that they can afford and, and be able to rent it. Um, and they can't be turned away just because they have a housing voucher. And so again, there are multifaceted policies um, that the entire community really is gonna have to um, engage together and collaborate on. Thank you, Jason. Um, Brent, did you want to talk about this a little or um, I actually have another question for you here, which is an order from landlords to avoid discriminating against potential tenants. All applicants must be screened against the same criteria. It's difficult to, it's difficult to offer someone a second chance because the same chance was not extended to others. On a larger scale, how do you see landlords being able to extend opportunity while avoiding accusations of discrimination? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, and, and we spent a lot of time on, on the steering committee trying to come up with a, the, the right program um, and, and put the right criteria in place so that that doesn't occur. Um, and, and Amy's probably got a little more detail than I do on that criteria, um, but it was, several meetings uh, and, and lots of hours put in place, uh, making sure we weren't violating any of the fair housing and, and also trying to develop a criteria that, that is fair to all, so. Yeah. Um, I have some questions, more questions about the policy agenda <clears throat> that would that move to Prosper has. I don't know if I'm Amy or Jason would like to speak about that. So with the policy agenda, Jason spoke to the need for um, inclusionary zoning. I'm not sure you use that word, but as we develop new affordable housing or new housing anywhere throughout the region, um, we see that regions that are successful do have mixed income housing and that's where you include um, housing at different price points so that everybody has an, has access to live where they want um, live where uh, jobs are being created um, we created move to prosper partially because as jason mentioned the racial inequities and income inequities throughout our uh, country and throughout our region, we can't build our way into having access for everyone. We have a built environment, and so how can we get existing landlords to feel comfortable to opening their doors and renting to people? We just asked the question to Brent, you know, to renting to people that they otherwise wouldn't be renting to. And so by having um, a mobility program where the landlord knows that they can work with Move to Prosper um, if there are any issues, they are more comfortable in renting to people who currently they would not be renting to. And so the program goes hand in hand to create more affordable housing by taking existing housing and enabling people to live there and at the same time encouraging requiring hopefully uh, new developments to be mixed income so that we have more affordable housing that way well, jason mentioned the legislation to protect people from discrimination due to their source of income I want to just expand on that a little bit um, he used the term housing vouchers um, housing vouchers are also held by veterans by people with um, uh, disabilities. So they come in many uh, different types of vouchers and it affects a lot of people in our community. Um, and right now, as the federal government is looking at providing more um, funding for rental support, um, that's coming out, to, uh, just came out 
in the House of uh, Representatives. It'll be voted on tomorrow. We'll see what happens. Um, but we know that more rental support is needed. And so as that comes out into the, uh, throughout the country, people should be able to use it and landlords should then um, be required to take it and um, enable people to choose where they're living. Um, source of income protections have been adopted um, by cities across the country as well as by states. Um, so, and it is supported by HUD actually. Um, so those are the types of legislation we're looking at. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their questions and for their answers. Um, Amy, before we end, um, can you um, share how our audience can get involved? So thank you very much and thank you everybody for being with us today. Research shows that even a few years living in a high opportunity neighborhood improves children's outcomes forever. And we want you to, to just be left with that. And that's why we are doing what we're doing. So please share with your friends, your relatives, colleagues, business leaders, um, policymakers, about what you heard today and why it's important that Move to Prosper um, or mobility programs be adopted within our region. It will take all of us working together to create an inclusive community for everyone. So we ask for your partnership in creating this housing mobility program. We can't do this ourselves. If you have any questions, if you'd like to get involved, if you need more information, feel free to contact me. Please uh, change the slide. Um, you've got my uh, contact information. If you'd like to see the summary um, of the evaluation, go to the Move to Prosper website. It's movetoprosper.org and click on the uh, report section and you can see the summary and the complete evaluation. Thank you for being on this journey with us as we create a more equitable region for everyone. Thank you so much, Amy. And thanks to all the panelists as well as to all of the audience participants. Um, you can see there's a lot going on here. It's not a, it's a, it's a huge initiative. Uh, it takes a lot to get something like this off the ground, uh, but it's very promising. I think the early results that we're seeing are promising. Uh, we're hopeful that we can continue this initiative and get more people in, help more families, and, and that's really the goal. Uh, so as I leave, I'd like to leave with just one quote. Uh, this is from a mom that's in the program. And uh, this quote says, I am just so thankful for the program and thankful for the opportunity. When you take housing and housing concerns out of the equation, your mind is free. My daughter can go outside and play. That's something she couldn't do before. I just hope you guys realize that everything you're doing to help pursue who we are because it's just made such a huge impact on our lives. So thank you again. I'm leaving inspired and I hope you are too. Thank you very much for your time today.